Buster, I had a lot of fun with you in this session, buddy. You are a great dog. He's very smart, and he was left for dead, evidently. Uh, his guardians rescued him, and I think uh, that early abandonment, how old was he when he was... Um, um, before a year. Okay. We got him out of So year. we don't know what happened to him, but I mean, a lot of dogs with separation anxiety, they just have bounced around a lot. It's an insecurity, but uh, this is his roadmap to success. He might have just... Uh, so these humans are finally taking care of me, I, I'm gonna look out for them. So um, we went over a lot of different things in this session. A lot of it, the, the startup was the things that probably are contributing to his insecurity, such as petting him when he's in an unbalanced state of mind, fearful, anxious, excited. Remember, if he's fearful, I can touch him and let him know I'm here with you without reinforcing it. But don't pet him when he's anxious. Um, let me see, uh, we went over some rules uh, to enforce. And the more, uh, the more rules that we, that we have, the more restrictions the dog has, we kind of shrink their world a little bit, but it also helps us act like leaders. So uh, some of the rules we went over is not being allowed on any furniture. Now, uh, he, uh, we have some, uh, some relatives who are really awesome and they're able to take him uh, during the day a lot of time, which is great because most people don't have that. And so it's, if you're watching this uh, and you're those relatives, uh, kudos to you because that's awesome. However, uh, most human food has onion and garlic in it, which are toxic for dogs. Also, for dogs to be within seven feet of a human who is eating is extraordinarily disrespectful. The analogy I use is it would be just as inappropriate for a dog to be within seven feet of someone's eating as it would be for us to watch someone undress unless we were in a relationship with them. So if you think you're doing the dog a favor by bringing the dog over and giving it some human food, you're actually training it to do something that is against its moral code, number one, and it also is something that makes them a little, a little bit more dependent on you, which is a correlated issue to the separation anxiety. So we do not want to have, uh, give, give him any fee, people food. One of the rules is he should not be allowed within seven feet of anyone who is eating any human food or has a high value item because that's how a dog would challenge for it. So if we invite him over when we have a fight item, that's very confusing for the dog. Now also, one of the rules is for dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or social status they have amongst their peers. If we let dogs sit at the same height as us, that's one of the ways that we say that we're peers. Now, um, we have uh, one room where he's not allowed in the furniture here in his home and another place where he can go on the furniture. That's confusing. Careful your finger doesn't go in the camera. Um, and so when he goes to spend the, uh, st spend the day at these relatives who are awesome for letting him do this, we cannot let him on the furniture there because that undoes all the work that's being done here. And uh, I don't mean it in a disrespectful way, but it's kind of, it's a little bit disrespectful for the work because it's gonna be a lot of effort that they're gonna have to put in. But if we think we're doing him a kindness by bringing him up, we are really undoing a lot of the work that uh, his primary guardians are going through, and it's gonna make rehabilitating him for his, rehab uh, for his separation anxiety worse. Now, uh, as I talked a little bit about in the above video, separation anxiety is essentially a panic attack. It is not something a dog is doing intentionally. So when it's having accidents, whether it's uh, pooping or peeing in the kennel, touring up carpet, howling, whining, whimpering, all these things are because the dog is in at the end of its rope. It is frazzled, it is frayed, it is panicking. Just like humans, we would never criticize somebody for panicking about some being afraid of spiders or whatever it is. So we never want to chastise or get upset with them. If he destroys something, remember you have a window of three seconds to correct or reward a dog for them to have the ability to make the connection. And so if he destroyed your carpet and you come home and you chastise him, bad dog, bad dog, he just knows that when you come home, you're sometimes pissed off at me for no apparent reason because it's way beyond that three second window. So. Um, we want to make sure that we don't uh, do anything that's going to make the situation worse. Uh, now, he knows a lot more commands than a lot of my dogs do, uh, a lot of my clients' dogs do. Uh, one of the things we can do, though, is the more uh, skills that he knows, uh, the more confident he's going to be. So uh, something that the guardians might want to do is actually go to YouTube or Google and look for other things to teach him to do. Not any tricks that cause him to put his paws on us. No shake and don't do the gopher thing or whatever that uh, command was. But teaching a dog to balance a treat on its nose is a great one because that right requires self-control. Stay. If the guardians forget how uh, I do the stay, message me and I can send you a link to a video. I teach the stay for the three Ds. First, for duration. The dog has to stay right in front of me for up to five minutes. And I progressively get there. Once we do that, then we start going for distance. Then we start going for distraction. If we have a windy day, putting him in a stay, once we've gotten to the distraction part, that would be a great thing for him to stay and filter out the sounds that are going outside. I know those panic and cause him a panic, so we move farther away from whatever that sound is coming and we give him a job. Staying preoccupies him. Dogs can only think about one thing at a time. So I can help him practice and focus on that as opposed to doing something else. We also went through a focus exercise. 
Um, I have other videos for that. So if you forget how to do that, make sure you let me know. I'd like the guardians to do the practice, the focus three times each per day. Now, if you're staying uh, at the relatives who are awesome, uh, if we teach them how to do the focus and have them do the same thing, remember it's one second, one second, keep the dog looking at your face, and eventually it's one second, 20 seconds on that second movement. Don't hold it up here and don't go like this. We want to hold it up to our nose first to keep the dog looking here and then go slowly towards in the tunnel of vision towards his mouth. Always, whenever we give a treat, we always want to say the name of the command after the treat goes in the mouth, not before, uh, whether it's the focus or anything else. Uh, let me see, other rules that we went over is that, that uh, Buster has to sit before we let him in or out of a door. I'm going to go to the door and I'm going to say sit one time. The more you repeat a command, the less you mean it, and you will train your dog to ignore your commands. So I say it once and I make it happen or apply consequence. consequence. So in this case, the dog wants to go outside. I'm in control of the resource at once. So if I go to the door and I say sit, I count to three. If it doesn't sit, I turn and walk away. I'm only going to say it once. I say it as an order. But I sit down and watch TV for one minute. Ask Siri for a 60-second timer, Alexa, or whoever you use. Usually I do this. Alexa starts charming him in the background. <laughs> um, after 60 seconds, go back to the door and again, command him to sit. As soon as he's... If he doesn't sit, I walk away this time for two minutes, next time for four, then eight, 16. Keeps on doubling the length of time. And as soon as you go and say sit and he sits, open that door like there's no control in his butt. So this way he learns and he will actually go start sitting at the door as his way of saying, I would like to go outside. Um, other rules, he shouldn't be allowed, like I said, within seven feet of any humans eating. Uh, if humans are preparing food in the kitchen, he should not be within seven feet of them. Um, let me see, uh, the humans need to eat something first. Remember, if you're going to eat something on the road or at work, just eat something in five or more bites and then give him permission to eat. And I use passive training for that. So I say, I have four dogs. I say grub, chow, feast, and one dog's eat. Try to use fun command words. Um, so when he takes his first bite of food, maybe say feast. If you do that every time you feed him for about two months, after a while you say feast, and he knows that's my word, I can go and eat. Um, so I went through, um, I'm going to go through passive training and petting with purpose in a second. He is not a fan of going downstairs because he was kept downstairs and the kennel was downstairs. Now for dogs, one of the worst punishments is to be actually excluded from the group. And we have an unfinished basement. And since the kennel was down there, we put it down there because he was destroying stuff and getting feces and all this rest of stuff she wanted in her living room, which I understand. But in the dog's mind, I am already in a panic state and now I'm being punished. So it makes it worse. Um, I usually see a little when your finger comes into the lens. That's okay. I just want to make sure it's a good video for you. Um, so uh, for the for the stairs, we can do the same sort of thing that we did for the kennel. Um, so basically, just take a treat and put them on on the steps. And you know, if he only goes down three steps, on the fourth step, put like five treats. So we call that a jackpot. And so uh, and then eventually, we're going to lead him further and further down the stairs. Uh, now, what we did for the kennel is we were tossing a treat in. He got to go in and get the treat and he got to leave. Now, if we are going to use a new kennel, the kennel that he has right now is not big enough, so we want to get one that's bigger. If we do that, we would want to come up with a completely new word for the kennel. And again, make it a fun word, castle, palace, you know, penthouse, whatever. And then uh, let, toss the treat and let him go and get the treat, and then after he licks it up, say penthouse, and then he gets to leave. And then after he does that enough, then if he gets the, once he gets to the point where he goes in on his own or starts poking his nose in, then we were putting the treats in the kennel after he illustrated us he was starting to go in there. So at first it's to entice the dog to go there, then it's to reward the dog for going there. Um, now for the kennel, I also have videos for this, so message me if you want uh, me to go through and it's an uh, in-depth video about all the stuff that I went over with the kennel. But we can do little tricks, so we can do things like drilling a hole through uh, the marrow of a frozen marrow bone and zipping it to the lower part of the kennel and, so, and leaving the door open. The kennel's now in the living room and we help him practice going inside the kennel while we're here. Most dogs don't like the kennel because number one, they're restrained and the only time I put in the kennel number two is when the humans leave me. So we help the dog practice being in the kennel while we're here and the door is open and there's a positive reinforcer, he's happy to go in there. So sometimes I'll just leave a treat or, or something in there as well and just don't put it out when he goes in there, say penthouse or whatever the word is. Uh, we want him to eventually to practice and eventually it took two hours but he went and he laid down in the kennel on his own and we'd like to get to the point where he starts going to the kennel on his own uh, and consistently spends more and more time in there. That way when we do transition to putting back in the kennel, he's comfortable in it. Now hopefully we don't have to put him in the kennel, that's the goal, but dogs with separation anxiety are in a panic state of mind and they will sometimes eat things or, or you know, I've heard, heard about dogs that chew power lines, uh, you know, trying to get through the drywall to get out and you know, that can be really bad. So we want to keep the dog safe so as long as we don't think that's, uh, that he's going to be safe we're going to use the kennel to, or the room or whatever it is to keep him safe. Uh, let me see, uh, passive training. 
A passive training is simply rewarding the dog every time it does something on its own. So the, every time Buster comes to me, I'm gonna pet him and say, come. Every time he sits on his own accord, I'm gonna pet him and say, sit. And again, when you sit, when you pet him, try to pet him under his chin and say just the command word, not good sit, not Buster sit, not good boy, just sit. Um, I use uh, the watchword uh, uh, reward or recognize. So if I'm in the room and then somebody says, reward to me, I look at Buster and whatever he's doing, I'm gonna turn and pet him. Remember, you have three seconds. The person saw it, that's one second. They told me about it, it's two seconds. I have one second now to be providing a reward to him. So if somebody says reward, I just go and stand there. I'm assuming he came and just say, come. Uh, if he's sitting, put him and say, sit. We're gonna teach him that these activities or actions are things that get the human's attention. Because right now he paws at us. So don't practice, like I said, the shake or this anymore, uh, for a while at least. Um, but eventually he'll start coming and demanding. He'll come and sit in front of you and say, look, I'm sitting, I'm laying down. Because these are things that we reward him for. Now that's also what we call passive training. If he comes and paws at us or nudges us or barks at us, he's going to get our attention and tell us what to do. If we pet him, that validates that. So instead when he paws at us, don't, do, don't, tell him, don't pet him, just give him a counter order. Tell him to sit. If he's already sitting, ask him to lay down or ask him to come sit over here. He has to do something to change his state. After a while, he'll come and start demanding as well. Sit in front of you to prepay for your attention and make sure you do pet, recognize and pet him for doing that. I say the word paycheck, if, if I come in the room and I see somebody's petting him and he's standing up, I assume they may, may have forgotten to pet him with a purpose. Paycheck just means I think he might have forgotten. You immediately stop petting the dog, you give it a command to sit, then you pet it on his chin and say sit and then you tell the person, I actually was, had him sit and he heard you when you come and open the door, he stood up and I continued petting him. David said that's okay, it is. But he has to either prepay or be, do a change his state in order to get affection. Once he sits, you can pet for five hours after that but I prefer to have everyone refrain from petting him unless he does something to earn it. Now he's an, uh, I don't wanna say, well, he's an insecure dog, but he has separation anxiety. So he, the more he has to earn that affection, the more of a sense of pride that he feels, and the better he's gonna feel about it. We need to boost his self-esteem and confidence. So by shrinking his world, by adding rules and structure, and then rewarding him for desired actions and behaviors, now he knows what he can do to make us happy, and he feels like he's earning that affection. Uh, now, uh, we, uh, we feed him out of a treat dispensing toy, but we might want to look at some other treat dispensing toys because that's a nice way to help him feel good because he earned the food. Uh, we want to make sure that whoever's feeding him eats something first in five or more bites, just a chip or cracker. It doesn't have to be a real meal. A real meal is even better. Um, but dogs eat in the order of their rank. So if he eats after the humans, that helps him see the humans as authority figures and having more rank or status than him. Um, we can't let him walk in front of us anymore. One of the guardians uh, that, that helps out with him is amazing. She's like super fitness person and she runs with him at like three or five miles a day. I mean, he's got it lucky because most people do not have that. So you should make sure you buy her a little <laughs> gift or make sure you acknowledge that because that is a great gift that most, I mean, most people don't have. But when she's running with him, he needs to run next to her, not in front of her. Now, um, if you want to uh, teach him to walk with a heel, let us know. We do our leash training actually without a leash, and we do it inside so we don't activate the opposition reflex, and it's pretty awesome. So if it's something you guys want to do when the weather gets a little bit nicer, we'd be happy to set up a, a, a training session with you to work on that. Um, if you ever take him to daycare, we're actually going to start doing daycare training. So you actually drop your dog off to a daycare, then we let him play for an hour, and then we grab it for five minutes, teach him how to heal, put it back in daycare for another hour, grab it for another five minutes. So at, at the end of the day, it gets an hour's worth of training, but you can't train a dog for an hour. You do it for little intervals. So let us know if you want to do that, or if you're watching at home and you want to do that, let us know at doggoneproblems.com. Uh, let me see, if he's in your way, uh, standing up, don't walk around him. Remember, burning energy matters. If you walk around him, that's one of the ways that we say that you are more important to me. I'm burning my energy, so you don't have to. So if he's in your way, walk through him. He needs to learn when a human is coming, my job is to defer and get out of their way. Use the escalating consequences to disagree with unwanted actions and behaviors. If you forget what those are, message me. I'm not, not going to go there, through them here in this video because if you're watching at home, you have to hire me to get that sort of secret. Um, let me see. Um, if, he is, if there is a repeatable sound that he is reactive to, um, again, I prefer to you try to redirect him with the focus exercise. Try to get to the 22nd mark of the focus within about 10 days or so. So really try to do that every, after you, he's already starting to get it, but you, within a day or two, you'll say focus in and stop what he's doing looking up at you. So you can use that to redirect his attention if he, before he starts getting worked up. Once he gets worked up, it's probably not gonna work. So remember to use it before. But you can also use counter conditioning. So if I can recreate, let's say there's a creaky sound outside and, and what, that only happens when the wind blows, I would move the dog far enough away where the dog, here's my two litmus tests. Can the dog stay seated while it hears the uh, stimulus? and will it take, continue eating the treat? 
So uh, I squish a treat and I let him nibble on it, so it takes about four or five bites to eat it. So the idea is I move him far enough away where he'll sit and take the treat while he hears that, and then I, he starts chewing it, and then I tell the person to activate this, the, the, the sound. And then while he is chewing the treat, he's hearing the sound. Then I have to talk to the person on the phone or have some way of stopping, because before the treat ends, the stimulus has to stop. So the, the process goes like this. I'm chewing on it, now I hear the stimulus, 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 the treat's almost gone, stimulus stops, treat's gone. And after a while, you can get him a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer to the stimulus. Eventually, you have it where the stimulus is right here, the creaky sound or whatever, he has learned to block it out. Or matter of fact, we've counter conditioned him to actually the stimulus is now a positive thing. Um, I'm probably forgetting some of the things that we went over in this three hour session, but I want the guardian to call me or text me. I mean, I say this for all my clients and I mean it. We don't charge for that. I want you to feel like you have somebody you can reach out to. I don't care if it's seven years after the session. Seven years in one day, that's too much, but no. Anytime, call me or text me. Texting is the fastest way to reach me. I get about 50 requests uh, a week. It's sometimes hard for me to stay on top of emails. And voicemails, I don't return unless I'm in front of my computer. If you text me a picture of him and, hey, remember, we worked with, you worked with Buster, had a, for, a question, what do I do in this situation? I'll get you a text back right away. All right, Buster. Come here, buddy. Am I treat? Oh, uh, something else you want to do. Um, the Guardians use a lot of different command words for him. I just get an example. I said, come here. So come up with a single command word for each word and write down a list of it. And if I, somebody's saying, come here, you say, ah, vocabulary. And the person says, ah, come. Sit. Sit. Always say the, the command word after the treat goes in his mouth. Shake. I know you know that one. You're supposed to shake with the other hand, though. There you go. There you go. Shake. This is Buster. This is Buster's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it. Isn't that right? One more time. Shake. It's a deal.